you either live by the gun or you die by the sword. Welcome to The Good, The Bad, and The Weird. I'm Nico. And I'm Chris. So for our movie today, I thought long and hard about what drink I could possibly get that would go along with our theme. So when I googled hobo drinks, all I kind of got was a bunch of bean water and then food wrapped in tinfoil. So I have wrapped Slim Jims in tinfoil as our treat for today. Also, I just really wanted Slim Jims. Yay. They felt, they felt more appropriate than a can of beans. Could have got in a brown bag. <sighs> yeah, I don't have any of those in this town. We live in Walmartville. There's no brown bags here. It's all plastic. Guess who has brown bags? Who? Yay! Slim Jim time! I don't really know why I feel like Slim Jim's a hobo food either. Because all of the commercials were targeted towards really hyperactive men. Oh yeah. It's man's food. So... For today's movie, much to the chagrin of my family, I picked Hobo with a Shotgun. Yes. I was debating on what horror movie or grindhouse-style film I should pick for Halloween, and I was toying between a few of them, and I thought, what about the very first gory grindhouse-style film I shared with friends and family? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. This doesn't seem like a your mom-style movie movie we go <laughs> it's none of my family style movie yeah it i mean cheesy so, gore is a good way to put it for people who haven't seen it because i wouldn't say it's a very well-known movie no hobo with a shotgun is well i don't think we said the name yet hobo with the shotgun is the movie we're reviewing um it's not i actually don't know anyone else who has seen it besides you now that i've shown it to Everyone. We have something to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, it was, came out in 2011, and I think part of the reason why, like, I hadn't heard of it, even though I do like, I do like uh, grindhouse movies, I do like cheesy gore movies, especially around the Halloween time, is because it didn't really have a theatrical release. No, it just kind of showed up at some film festivals and then was released to DVD, which. There's a little bit more behind that, and we'll go over that later. Um, but to kind of set the premise of this film, because I'm sure a lot of people haven't seen it, the basis of this movie is about a homeless man who goes to a new city. I think it's called Scumtown. I think so. And finds out that the world, that the entire city is run by this dickhead dad and his two obnoxious sons. Very obnoxious. And it's a so Hobbs. he decides. <laughs> Hi, Hobbs. Hi, Tubby. You're the cute cat. And so he decides he's going to clean up the city one person at a time. Yes. And that's the very basics of the story. Yeah. And I did find it interesting that they chose to make the main character a hobo. And they didn't just pick the word hobo and run with it. Mm-hmm. Um. Because I, I decided, of course, to base my research on the hobo part of this movie. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, hold on, I, I'm going to keep your cat from eating tinfoil. Thank you. Don't eat tinfoil, Hobbs. <laughs> so, the, the term hobo, we're not, like, super sure where it comes from, from, a, like, a, at least a North American sense of the word. But we think it's the 1890s is about when it showed up. And it's a very specific word. It originally only referred to migrant workers and homeless people that traveled but also worked. So, example, tramps, they don't want to work. Uh, bums, definitely not working. Hobos will go to... Hobos will work. Hobos will show up in your town and find some work and then go on to the next town. And they always seemed to pick trains. It's usually free, but buses were also an option. Which, interestingly enough, they managed to tie all of this sort of stuff mm -hmm. into the movie with this character. Um, yeah, it's a very vagrant. Uh, vagrant or vagabond kind of lifestyle. Yes. Um, um, I did learn that the uh, song that they use in the beginning of the movie, 
Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Now you have officially seen part of Hobo with the... Sh- or part of Cannibal Holocaust. Yes. Because I thought it sounded very similar to the intro of that movie. And it does come from a different exploitation film. Yeah. Um, I think it was Mark of the Dead or Devil? One of Mark of the Devil. Something like that. Some yeah. old 70s grindhouse exploitation film. Which I kind of liked because while the music in this movie wasn't bad, it by no means was like a founding piece of it. But that kind of added to the mm-hmm. B-style horror that it had going on, which I kind of liked. And it also, for me, I felt... After hearing that the order of the filming, that him riding the train in was actually their last day of shooting everything. Yeah. And so they just took their time. They rented the train or rented time on the train, just enjoyed shooting for the day. Yeah, which makes sense. So before we really get into the movie, though, I do want to establish and go through a little bit of the history of what grindhouse and exploitation films are. Yes, because it's a pretty broad term. It's a broad term, and I feel it's also a misconstrued or misunderstood term in itself. Yeah. So, we'll st- first of all, before even that, I kind of want to establish where filmmaking and distribution was at that time. So, ex- uh, Grindhouse theaters date back from the early 20s, and they come from the Grind Policy. Yes. Which was the policy of just pumping out movie after movie. The rates went up as the day progressed, but they also focus on double, triple, and all-day features. And then also it refers to the uh, barkers, the people who would say, hey, come see this movie or come see the circus, this attraction. Yeah, I think nowadays most people think of the barkers in a carnival sort of sense, Mm -hmm. especially with like the old-timey portrayal of, like, freak shows or side tent circus acts. That's kind of the thought, but it was more common back in the day. Mm -hmm. Like, it wasn't just theaters that did this for my research. A lot of people used this as their version of advertising. Yeah, and on top of that, there's a misconception that it's associated with the uh, burlesque dances or the striptease shows of the 20s and, well, still going on. Yeah. But uh, because of the dance style called the bumping grind. Ah, yes. And not and, to be confused with current day bumping grind, I assume. Well, I mean that's more common. You don't have <laughs> you just go to a high school dance to see or just a dance party dance party in general. But uh so there's actually a specific definition for what a grindhouse is. The Oxford Di- <laughs> the Oxford dictionary defines the criteria as shows a variety of films in continuous succession low admission fees, film screened are frequently poor quality or low artistic merit. Yeah. And I think it's kind of translated into B-movies nowadays. Not quite in the same sense, but kind of in the same, like, crank it out, quality's not Mm -hmm. as important as the quantity, we're just trying to get stuff made. And that's very much how the old days of filming were. And in the... uh, So, even though Grindhouse started in the 30s, or not, sorry, 30s, the 20s. Mm-hmm. The 30s is where things started to become a bit more complicated. I, at this point, I'd like to acknowledge my sources for today uh, for the history of Grindhouse and exploitation, Wikipedia. Of course, my favorite source. <laughs> As for up until then, the pre-code era, I'm going to refer to Forbidden Hit or Forbidden Hollywood, uh, written by Mark Vieira, and it's a great history on the pre-code era. It only covers really the very end of the 20s and up till 34 when code was actually enforced and the american morals were ah yes solidified so the roaring 20s actually led to a lot of censorship in films yeah and so uh they used to actually have a lot of sexual undertones and not so subtle ways where like the younger audience wouldn't get it but the older audience would but not in the way like not, Disney does it I was now. say, not a Pixar style anymore? No, it's it's very suggestive. Yeah, um, gotcha. And even by the late, or by 34, they were, sugge- they were showing films with homosexuality, and that was a big no-no. Um, also at this time, there was a big movement of, you guessed it, the Midwest Catholic Church. Ah, uh, 
Yeah. Yeah, they were very against any movie that had any adult, like they any adult theme. They were even against uh, saying a, a woman saying, "I'm having a baby." They thought there was a much more romanticized way, I guess, to say it. I mean, I'm sure there is, but also, I don't know, it feels very straight to the point. They wanted to get away from the cow and the calf. Yeah. I I mean, I feel like history, we've seen this a lot, Mm -hmm. and movies, unfortunately, are the most recent example of the art to family-friendly art. And now we're kind of reaching back up to, uh, well, it has a rating on it, so it should be fine, right? And, I don't know. We've seen that. We've seen this roller coaster before. We saw it with Midsummer. We did. And Deadpool. And what's the new one that people are complaining about? <sighs> I don't remember. This seems to happen quite frequently. They're always complaining about stuff. I remember when I was a kid, Harry Potter was the big, oh. you don't take your children to this because it promotes witchcraft. I do remember that as well. Yeah. I win anyway. Harry Potter's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> so... Back to the history. So, in the early 30s, we had that buildup of purity and the American dream. This was going on during the Great Depression, and the uh, more yes. sin was promoted, it seemed the better the box office op- box offices did. Yeah, and the Great Depression kind of also ties into the overarching theme of the movie. Um, hobos really started having quite the influx of people becoming hobos because of the Great Depression. A lot of people couldn't find work in their town, so they hopped on railways hoping to find work somewhere else. Mm-hmm. It hit a lot of people really hard, and I think the Great Depression, you could see a huge shift in the two different mindsets. There was the mindset of people who were going to do whatever it took to get it done, and then those who thought maybe if we bring some morals back to this standard, we might see a different path. Mm-hmm. And unfortunately, the hobo side, because of just the nature of it, became a very opposite to that, as it was a very dangerous lifestyle in Mm -hmm. general. And then, at the same time, I do want to make a distinction between the different types of cinema. Um, During the 20s and early 30s, I I don't know how far it actually went before the government stepped down, because originally theaters were owned by the distributors and the manufacturers. They were all one and the same, so... Paramount, Universal, Fox, they all own their own specific cinemas. Gotcha. Um, But also at the same time, there were uh, discount and neighborhood theaters. And these were separate from Grindhouse Cinema or Grindhouse Theaters. Grindhouse Theaters normally had the first run of movies that weren't approved or just didn't even care about going through the whole studio system. Gotcha. Whereas neighborhood uh, and discount movie theaters generally show it as a second run. So, like... Oh, I used to have one of those as a kid. It was, like, $2 to watch, like, crazy old movies. mm -hmm. It was great. Or even, like, a movie that's been out a month and a half. Yeah. Ah, they tore it down. Sad day. Grindhouse Cinema actually had a start of decline in the 60s. And in the late 60s, we had a leniency in... Uh, the codes of what could and couldn't be shown in theaters and yeah. the really starting of the radio or rating system. Mm-hmm. Um, on top of that, television, urban decay, white flight, also changing economics in the 60s led to the decline of grindhouse theaters. Sure. Because now people were going away from the city and so they were having to bring the theaters out to people. People weren't willing to go into the cities. Yeah. And then so by the 70s, grindhouse theaters were known for specifically showing exploitation films that included pornography, slasher horror, and Hong Kong martial arts films, to name a few. Yeah, it was Almost, kind of the hodgepodge of stuff that the normal movie theaters didn't think they would make a profit on. Yeah, even drive house theaters started to become towards that. Like, uh, I know in, uh, in movies they reference going to see, like, I spit on your grave in theaters. Yeah. Um, but not to... Uh, say that that's all they showed. They also showed art films. Oh, sure. So, like, films like A Clockwork Orange that weren't allowed in theaters or were banned from public viewing. These theaters are like, we'll take the controversy. We'll we'll show them. Yeah. Controversy is free I mean, advertisement. Especially if you think at it from a movie theater's point of view, controversy is going to be controversy no matter which film they show, so they might as well show them all. Mm-hmm. And so, on top of that... 
in the ninety in the eighties and nineties with the invention of home video, cable, movie channels, Grindhouse really started to become obsolete. And before the end of the nineties, they had vanished from L.A., uh, NYC, and San Francisco, and like the major areas, yeah. like uh, Broadway and uh, Times Square. And so I didn't really do much more digging into it, unfortunately. I don't even know if they're still around. I mean... At least in the U.S. I don't... And um, he, even then... It's hard the, to say. Well, Grindhouse even then is just a U.S. term. True. Like, in Britain they had the Video Nasties. True. Which just straight up got banned. And I think we talked about it, like, they've repealed some stuff a little bit, but some just yeah. movies are... I think, I think at least nowadays, instead of having the Grindhouse... Uh, theater mentality i think the straight to dvd uh film producers have kind of taken over what that genre could have been mm -hmm. uh i know it's kind of a weird thing because a lot of them will have more niches but if you ever look into the companies who like produce and distribute these super low budget just crank it out sort of style of dvds the same company who's cranking out Frozen like ripoffs is also cranking out weird martial art rips offs mm -hmm. and some dark horror rip offs, and, and that's a that's a kind of exploitation film. Yeah, it's a mockbuster. Oh yeah, They're I love trying, a mockbuster. Yeah, most of them are trying to get it out even before the big name movie comes out, so that way. Yeah, and it's the same sort of mindset for mockbusters as it is for Grindhouse, where it's not really about the quality. We're not really too concerned about whether or not we get a big name for this or if we're going to attract a lot of people. Our hope is just that enough people will see it to pay for the DVD cost. Mm -hmm. And that's a big thing about exploitation films. So uh, to give it a rough definition, because exploitation films are very from the viewer's point of view, what they see as ex ex exploitative. So uh, generally it's a film that attempts to succeed financially by exploiting current trends niche genres or lured content yes and there's a ton of subcategories too there are so many so many like um some of the better known ones are uh cannibal films which you oh, know sure. is one of my bigger ones um ozploitation which is aussies mm -hmm. canuxploitation which is i think probably the first one we talked about oh yeah i guess it would be it was your birthday last year when you brought <laughs> up rubber uh okay so for those of you who don't know rubber rubber it has been a year-long struggle even though you own the movie <laughs> for me to watch and it is a movie about a sentient murdering tire a psychic killer tire. A psychic killer tire. And every time I see the trailer, I'm just in awe and wonder <laughs> that this movie even exists. You know, for my birthday this year, I'm going to watch it. Well, well, we'll get to it at some point. We will. And uh, some of the early exploitation films, and even nowadays, we have uh, like nudist films or sexploitation films. Even slasher films. Yeah. I mean, we. That that's the thing is like we can talk about like... Uh, Black Christmas is considered the one of the first slasher films. Same with Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Oh, sure. And then any movie writing that trend, oh, this movie was successful, that could be considered an exploitation film. Like, there's a small subgenre called Leesploitation. After Bruce Lee died, there was a rise of stars with different spellings of Bruce Lee, like L-I, instead of L-E-E. Ah, uh, yes. And so that's its own little... Uh, microcosm of films that had a very short time frame. yeah and i think you could even make an argument that the this term covers films that are also specifically targeted to an audience mm -hmm. so a good example would be uh the christian romance genre there's not a wide variety of people who are interested in that genre but the people who are interested in it are interested because of what it is and who it's mm -hmm. targeting and like we talked about uh, earlier in the week, uh, the Christ uh, the Christ exploitation genre. Oh, sure. Where it's a film genre that's directed towards it, it's exploitative in regards to the non-believers, where it's supposed to make you feel bad for not believing in their belief system. Sure. Whereas on the opposite side, and I've come across a couple people where they've argumented or, or argued that it's a fantastic movie. It's faith restoring. It's Oh, or their faith yeah, restoring, yeah, yeah. and it's th that's the thing between grindhouse and exploitation. 
Grindhouse is specifically an American cinema style, whereas exploitation is worldwide too. Oh yeah. Like we have the Italian uh, uh, Giallo films or the Japanese Chandra films. Yeah, and I also think that the the Grindhouse is definitely focused completely on movies, whereas exploitation films kind of has moved over into different branches of film as well Mm -hmm. we've seen a ton of exploitation documentaries pop up in recent years especially around the weight crisis that's going on here in america and the uk even then our understanding of what a documentary is because when i was a kid i watched a documentary and it was truth but now we're starting to really understand the editing and removing of it's Are turning you... more into a movie than it is a documentary from the traditional sense of the word. Mm-hmm. But I still think that the overarching, very broad category of exploitation films yeah. definitely could envelop that. And on top of that, generally the exploitation genre are low quality, but they can garner uh, critical praise or a cult following. Like, for example, Night of the Living Dead. Oh, definitely. And it even started to set a standard, which then could maybe argue that it jumps categories a mm-hmm. little bit. Nothing's stable. Yeah. And, I mean, we first saw these movies in the 20s. Yeah. Uh, with films such as Reefer Madness. Yeah. And they to get around code and people, uh, ad, uh, to get around sh- drug usage in movies and nudity... They promoted them as educational films uh, to promote against yes. drug usage. Good had to always triumph at the end. Yes. And I think nowadays we see a similar sort of loophole with the whole movie theater version versus DVD editor's cut edition, where mm-hmm. the movie theater version might not necessarily touch quite as deep into the darker parts of the movie that the editor's version or the... Like, ultimate release, silver label Mm -hmm. edition will go in an extra 30 minutes sometimes. Or like Alien 3, where, if I remember right, they fired the original director partway through, threw a new director at it, and then didn't even give him rights to cutting. Yeah. And so he's only there basically in name alone. and That sucks. (laughs) People got pissed at him because it wasn't a great Alien film. Yeah. Um, Uh, Poor Alien. But, so, Grindhouse, uh, like I stated previously, in regards to the rise of uh, exploitation films, they started to have a popularity in the 60s and 70s after censorship became more relaxed in regards to what could and couldn't be shown in theaters. Yeah. And even then, they worked outside of the Hollywood system anyway, so they didn't really care to begin with. Um, But only in the 90s have we started to see a rise of attention and... I would, interest even, in them. I would even say a lot of these old ones are starting to reach like a new level of cult classic because mm-hmm. we've seen a lot of them getting remakes or reprints or new box cart uh, box art that's limited edition for Halloween sort mm-hmm. of stuff. And even that can be seen as an exploitative move in itself. So oh, for sure, I'm going to spend money on one that's got Deadpool on the front. Yeah, you know it. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I also learned about a term that these are referred to. They're referred to as paracinema. Okay. Where they're not on the level of, like, Rosemary's Baby in regards to horror, but they're still, there's something to them that people still love. Definitely, because I think a lot of us who like these movies, especially the horror genre group of them, and then also the ones that fall under the more uh, broad category, like the spaghetti westerns or mm-hmm. the kung fu movies, we're going to watch all of them. Like, that's just the kind of fans these movies usually like congregate around Mm -hmm. but i think now it's becoming less of a oh you watch kung fu movies and more of a oh i've seen a couple kung fu movies too yeah they're becoming mainstream because you'll get that one big hit like night of the living dead there's a lot of people who have seen zombie movies because of that or they know of it because of other zombie films like the walking dead yes i would say there was a the huge craze with the walking dead i never got into it but I loved zombies before then, and then all of a sudden, all a bunch of friends I knew who had never watched a horror movie in their life loved that series. Yeah, and I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing. I just think that it's kind of an interesting loop back around to kind of, I don't know, it's like a weird cycle. Mm-hmm. But, I don't know, we'll see how the cycle continues next. Yeah, and as you know, I'm very into 
uh, exploitation films. Yes. I love them because, again, they can approach subject matter that is not tackled in large films. Definitely. And, I can see the appeal in it. Yeah. And so the reason I wanted to talk about the history of Grindhouse and Exploitation is because we had this discussion early, earlier on when we decided we're going to do this movie. And I'm like, this is an exploitation film. And you're like, no, no, it's not. It is. It is. It is very much an exploitation film in, I will say, the Grindhouse style because Grindhouses don't exist anymore. And without the theaters, you can't really, I don't feel you can really call it a true Grindhouse film. It is the Grindhouse style. Uh, I'll say that's fair. I would say that <coughs> you could make the argument that this is exploitation of uh, homeless people for the overarching theme of this one, mm -hmm. which isn't necessarily a broad category in the exploitation industry, but it's still a genre that I've run across a couple of times now. Mm -hmm. So I see where you're coming from. Uh, I think most people don't have the time or effort to research the definition of exploitation films. No. <laughs> and so unfortunately, I think colloquially, it's kind of been more reserved for very intense, uh, higher end of taboo. Mm -hmm. Whereas Hobo with a Shotgun definitely sits very nicely in the, yeah, your friend who's a little squeamish could still watch it category. Yeah. Yeah, it, it just depends on the person. Definitely. Um, like... I wouldn't say that this one, they they definitely hit the B rating nice and hard. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the special effects aren't so much that if you're overly queasy, it would get to you. Yeah, there's language. Of course, there's language. Yeah, there's, you know, inappropriate themes. There's drug use. All of those things are there, but they're done in such a B movie style that it kind of puts it closer to the acceptable range than other movies that mm -hmm. could potentially exist and so the reason i chose this film and my thought process in regards to this is i was trying to decide on do i want to do grindhouse do i want to do the double feature of uh planet terror and uh death proof fair because they were released together as grindhouse and again it plays with that spirit of the double feature yeah i can um, see that so i was thinking about it and i thought about doing planet terror because I'm not super knowledgeable about car exploitation films. I'm more familiar with uh, female revenge stories. Sure. So I felt death proof. I couldn't do a good enough job covering it this time. And then I thought about Planet Terror. And Planet Terror is very much a zombie slash war slash... Yeah. It, it, slash slashing. Yeah, it, it, <laughs> it encompasses a wide genre of grindhouse. Oh, yeah. Also, Robert Rodriguez always um as we know from spy kids <laughs> <laughs> great performance <laughs> so and also what got me towards it is hobo with a shotgun actually started out as a mock trailer for grindhouse which i thought was super cool because mm -hmm. especially nowadays with the rise of things like music videos um trailers being cranked out left and right and then a bunch of small creators being able to create bigger more cinema style things on places like youtube and just internet in general the idea that someone can make a fake trailer and then turn it into a real movie mm -hmm. really excites me and makes me very hopeful for the future because well, how many times have i seen a music video or like a little short and been like guys they're making it into a movie and you guys are like no it's fake like that mike snow ah, song oh yes genghis khan i would love to see that as a movie and now watching going through like the bond films yep i completely understand like a lot of the references and like yeah i want it, to see bond make... and the villain become a settled down family that one was a good <laughs> one and then i remember very distinctly when taylor swift's bad blood came out the music video for it was done in a very, I don't know, super spy, all girls, almost Charlie's Angels-esque store of style that a lot of people really wanted it to be mm -hmm. a full-length thing, a book, a movie, something. And so maybe someday someone will make it for me. Well, like, I mean, uh, another reference is VHS. Oh, sure. Uh, have you seen that one yet? Not all the way. Okay. Well, you know the siren portion? Yeah, yeah. That got built, or that got made into a full feature film. Yes. And the chick who played the siren came back and replayed it. Oh, I didn't realize that. That's pretty cool. Yeah. I, I, 
I think it came out a couple of years ago. I just haven't got around to it yet. Oh, same. Um, but, so, that is where this movie comes from. Yes. And, honestly, it is it is a weird mashup of films. Like, it has some big names. It has the main actor, Rutger yeah. Hauer. Yes. Who I only knew from Blade Runner. Same. Listening to the director and... Uh, the producer and writer all talk about him. I didn't realize how much of a star actor he really was. Like I know he's in other stuff because he like I'll I'll watch stuff and be like I think I know who you are, and then you click on him and you're like oh you're in all the things. Of course you're in all mm-hmm. the things. But he's he's got one of those faces that blends in really good with the movie he's in, so he doesn't stand out to me like some other actors do. Yeah, unfortunately I found out he died this year. Oh, that makes me very sad. I yeah. kind of liked all of the movies he was in now that I'm reading through the list. Um, And if you haven't played Kingdom Hearts 3 yet... I'm still getting there. He is the new voice, or he was the new voice of Master Xehanort. Oh, cool. After Leonard Nimoy died. Ah, uh, I think it's a good fit. Yeah, so I'm sitting there, I'm like, Okay. I'll I've, get a new one now. <laughs> I've heard Master Xehanort swear now. Good. <laughs> so, but, and then on top of that, they had uh, Rob Wells of Trailer Park Boys fame, which I don't know if you're super familiar with that show. I'm not super familiar with that show, but I know his face. Yeah, he's he's in a lot of memes. That's, that's probably where I know him that's from. That's where you know him from. Him See, and that's how you know you're really famous. <laughs> you, you're memeable. When you're super memeable, that's when you're famous. Yeah, and again, that's all I know him from is Trailer Park Boys and this. Yeah, fair. So, uh, back to how this movie started. Yes. Um, one of the things in rewatching it, because I listened to the special features before we actually watched the movie. Yeah. Um... Uh, Jason Eisner, the director, was talking about that he was inspired by westerns for this movie. I can see it. Yeah. And I can see it. Yeah. He, There's a lot of gl- gunslinging, pick yourself up by your boots sort of mentality going on. The lone warrior coming into town. Yeah. Which definitely, definitely. is a ripoff from Yojimbo. Definitely. Which, but also, I don't know, it fit in with the character being who he was Mm -hmm. wonderfully so because honestly i think if they had gotten rid of some of those aspects it could have just been any dude he didn't have had to come to town he could have been from anywhere in the city already Mm -hmm. but because they went ahead and added this sort of western this town's not big enough for the both of us sort of mindset well now he's this hero who blew into town to save the day yeah and on top of that uh we're they do a very good job of introducing us to this not only the character but the city they do because he brings in he he comes in he's just doing his thing he's collecting trash recycling getting ready to recycle he sees a a bum fight which yes reference back to those uh 2000 youtube videos of the guys paying bums to fight each other so sad yeah and then he immediately sees uh rob wells character come running around the corner of a neighborhood and his cousin or his nephews and his brother in tow chasing him down. Yes. He has a manhole cover over his head. Which I have questions about. <laughs> yes, we have many questions about. Those things are heavy. They are really heavy. And then on top of that, they kick him into an open manhole. How is he not like broken something? Anything. I don't know what. I'm not a doctor, but something in that action must break. I don't either. The thing I love about it. Is it so clearly foam? Oh, it's so clear. Like, no <laughs> one struggles whatsoever to, like, wear this thing. It, it doesn't really seem to, like, be closed in any meaningful way. Like, there's definitely a chain and a lock at the top. But how do you, like, snap it around someone's head? Like, it's a circle. I just, mm-hmm. There's a lot of mechanics I'm missing here. But I love it's it. still a fun part because then they use it to rip off his head with barbed wire once he's in the manhole. And I think that scene specifically sets the gore tone for the rest of the movie. Mm -hmm. Because, well, yes, they totally do rip this guy's head off with barbed wire, which I'm not, again, 100% sure that this is how that works, anatomy. (laughs) It's grindhouse. Physics do not matter in this movie. Physics do not count in this movie whatsoever. Neither do buildings. But anyway, (laughs) like, the 
the ridiculousness of the head rolling off and just looking like what a child assumes you look like when you've died. Mm -hmm. Like, they don't put any real effort into looking up actual death faces. This is just what a child would look like if you went bang, bang, and you go, uh. <laughs> and well, the amount of blood just kind of fountaining up from this man's now deceased torso. And a lady dancing in it. it yeah, and it's not even like a little nice uh, fountain-sized squirt. This is a full-on, she is showering in his blood. Kung Fu movie, yeah. arm removal blood. Yeah, this is a lot of blood coming from this <laughs> man's neck. And uh, they actually did that in one take. They only could, they only had time to do it once. And they asked the the dancer, like, "Hey, are you sure you can do this?" She gets and to she's do like, it. They're like, "Are you sure you don't want to show it to us?" And she's like, "I got it." And they <laughs> she, she did a good job. They liked it. Yeah. And that shot, they had to uh, open up a manhole cover on like a the next one over to pour everything through to get, get it to it shoot again. out. <laughs> um, on top of that, they actually shot that in a neighborhood and a lot of the extras are just neighbors who came out to watch it. And the directors are like, children, calm down, calm down. Don't you parents, you might want to cover your kids eyes of what's going to happen next. They were loving it. They had a great time. They had a great time. See, that seems to be the general <laughs> theme for all like, Hey, I just showed up and now I'm in a horror movie sort of situations. Mm -hmm. It seems like most of the people have an awesome time and makes me want to also be an extra in a horror movie. Well, and part of this, it was a local production for yeah. the most part. Um, Rutger Hauer was really the only big name that they brought from out of town. This is true. Because it, it's a Canadian film. Yeah, and like when I'm going through the list of actors, like to be honest with you, I didn't know most of these people. Mm -mm. And uh, one of my favorite things about that scene too, I know we've doted on it for a bit. But it is a really good scene. <laughs> This this makes it even a little bit better. Uh, one of the background characters uh, he had been mostly blind for his life, had laser collect or had corrective eye surgery of some kind, and his vision started coming back when they were shooting that scene. <laughs> and so one of the first things he saw was the blood gushing everywhere. And I think it was the writer or the director who mentioned that uh, <laughs> they remember talking to him afterwards. And him, or him mentioning that red was such a beautiful color. <laughs> Aww, how nice. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, uh, after I... he sees this person get their head ripped off, and we see who's running the town. Yes. Uh, Which... well, the Drake is his name. So, the Drake is a weird character to me, because he toes the line somewhere between an Italian mob boss and old school Riddler Joker sort of crazy over the topness and just giggliness an insane bob barker yeah which was kind <laughs> of a weird like character to watch in this town because while he's not out of place there were multiple like points in the movie where we were joking about how cartoony he is which mm -hmm. i think i don't know i feel like that kind of adds to his crazy over the topness well, and that's one of the things, too, is the uh, day and night between the characters. The hobo, uh, Rutger Hauer and Jason Eisner, had a discussion of how they think the hobo should act. Yeah. And they decided very much so from the beginning that he was going to be the grounded character in all this cartoon violence that was happening around him. Yes. He was supposed to be the believable character in... For the most part, he is. Oh, yeah. A lot of us question why anyone still lives in this town mm -hmm. at all. Why, like, there's apparently people who still go to school normally in this crazy town. Like, people mm -hmm. still go. Like, people are pretending that this isn't happening. But he is clearly seeing the absolute, like, remote, like, most ridiculous mm -hmm. town he's ever been to in his whole life. And then right after seeing that, he goes to just do what he was doing to begin with. He was just going back to his day-to-day -day life. He writes out a sign that just says, I am tired. Yeah. And, I mean, we we all feel that. Like, oh, yeah. I, I think that's when you really start to kind of connect with the hobo, just because it's... Definitely. Well, and he also reacts very much how I think a lot of us would react mm -hmm. if walking to this town, because uh, the brother of the Duke, who I don't remember his name, unfortunately. I know they yell it at him at one point, but... It's gone. Yeah, he's so minor. He's he's very dead. Uh, but he, he runs up to him, pleading him for help. Mm -hmm. And the hobo reacts, I think, in the most 
logical way that he could. He didn't know this man. He's in a strange town. He doesn't know what he's doing. He doesn't understand what's going on. So he backs away, says no. Mm -hmm. And then we also kind of start to learn of what his goal is. He stops by a pawn shop? New thing shop? I don't know. What's considered new in this nasty town? I don't know. But he sees a lawnmower and he's watching it. And then he moves on. Yeah. Because he needs to make money in town now. Yes. And then, goal. so the lawnmower actually comes from the original actor who played the hobo for the trailer. Yeah. And uh, he, they, they told that, he, they told, uh, I think it was Jason Eisner was talking about it. That uh, he's a man who lives off of disability, but he doesn't want that to be his only income. He still wants to do something and make it his way. So he mows lawns in his spare time when he can. Which I think think is a pretty good, like, wholesome moral Mm -hmm. for this guy to try and, like, encompass. Is he just wants to mow some yards for money. Yeah, he just wants to live out his life. He just wants to not necessarily have the good life but have a better life than what he has. Yeah. And then we're quickly reminded that the city he's entered is not that kind of city. He's no. spat on by punks. He sees the one of the brothers roll up in the car. Which, the brothers are an interesting visual, because the whole town, everyone in the town, even from the moment that the main character gets into town, everyone and everything is old, beat up, and dirty. And their names are Slick and Ivan. Yes, they are. <laughs> which Ivan is a very Russian mobster name. It is. And Slick, and Slick is the very <sighs> greaser kind of name. Slick very much could have been a greaser. Slick also reminds me a whole lot of Hocus Pocus Ice. Mm-hmm. Like, they're just, they're absolutely stupid. They're completely <laughs> idiotic. They're teenagers trying to live up to this mob boss dad, who's clearly not a proper mob boss by any sense of the word like he doesn't have his stuff together Mm -hmm. but he does it's just they are a confusing trio but i like the visual of them always appearing with new things with clean white shirts clean white leather Mm -hmm. school jacket what is that leather jacket leatherman jacket of some kind it looks stupid (laughs) they're this weird combination of like the high school jock the greaser and yeah. mob bosses. They were, they definitely felt from like a character building standpoint, every bully that you could think of as like a young adult teenage person mm-hmm. that you had to face up with all kind of squished together into one or three characters. Yeah. And then on top of that, we're brought into their hideout because first what draws our attention to the hideout is the punks who spit on his sign, drag a hobo into uh, the Drake club. Which the Drake Club. The uh it needs a new name. <laughs> uh well the hobo who's a, or the yeah, the hobo who's abducted by the punks, that's the director. Ah, uh, yes. There they, were a lot of secrety sneaky cameos in this one. They were short one person and they had to bring him <laughs> in, which we had I had the fun game of Guess the Girlfriend. Uh yeah, we played Guess the Girlfriend. It was very difficult. The writer, director, and producer's girlfriends are all in the movie. It's a fun game to play. I don't really want to spoil it for you, because it is fun to look up and figure out who's playing what. Mm -hmm. Because there's a lot of background ladies in this movie that it could be any of them. One of them, tying back to the early days of Grindhouse, she is a burlesque dancer. Yes. (laughs) And that's how they're able to get uh, her and her friends up there. Yeah, because she, like, brought her friends on set, right? Yeah. Yeah. Good for her. (laughs) I've got a good part with that coming up. Uh, So... Also, once we're in the app, I, re- I actually really like their club. Like, the club, not the club, the clubhouse. The clubhouse is pretty sweet. It's like a grungy arcade. Yeah. But also kind of a fairground at the same time. It very much feels like uh, like a combination of all of the, like, cool things you mm-hmm. weren't allowed to do as a safe child <laughs> sort of thing. Where yeah. it's like, oh, this is the dirty part of the carny. But it looks super fun. Yep. And, uh... I like bringing up uh, when they, we see people who are related to the main cast or uh, the production crew. Because the hobo we see who gets his head crushed between the bumper cars, that's the producer's dad. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right, all right. Which is kind of cool seeing, like, okay, we need people. Hey, do you want the small little role in it? And, like, getting their family, their community involved, and then it becomes this 
whole production that people are tied to kind of, again kind of like jaws yeah definitely i think i think especially in the horror and more specifically the slasher gory genre of horror um it seems like people really enjoy bringing their friends who are also secret horror lovers onto set and you can really tell when people like that are on because it really does change it from like a meh it's a b movie to like this was a pretty good movie to watch everyone clearly was having a like i wouldn't say clearly having a good time because they did a good (laughs) job acting they're not like giggling throughout the streets but they're definitely like full in they are here for the moment sort of acting as opposed to some of the other b ones that i watch where like yeah you were paid twenty dollars to stand there good job (laughs) My family had the exact opposite of me showing them this movie. Yeah, I, I can understand that. Yeah. <laughs> this what? isn't their style. Why the hell did you make us watch that? I, I get that a lot. Yeah. Um, but anywho, so this is actually the first time we have confrontation with the hobo. Yes. There were, and also at the, we're introduced to a uh, sex worker who has a heart of gold. Yes. And she's trying to make it big. She hits on... The, uh, Slick, I think, is the one that we're... Yeah, Slick is the, like, main son. The Ivan, the secondary son, we really don't get to see much of him from, like, a character development sort of standpoint. Because he's he's the neglected child, and that's perfect. Yeah, it works out, though. And so, uh, she's trying to proposition him, and he's going to plan to do some monstrous thing to her because he's a horrible person he is he is in fact a horrible person and so this is the first time the hobo confronts them he's and this is impressive too because it's not like he's just taking on like an underling he's taking on one of the big trinity and not just any of the big trinity the favorited big trinity Mm -hmm. like next to drake himself because drake is drake i would argue that's targeting the sun is more dangerous because mm-hmm. if he went after drake himself he's crazy enough that it might not do any like it wouldn't really upset him mm-hmm. he'd be mad but i don't think he'd be as mad as if he went after his favorite child and if he went after the other child well he doesn't care about that one clearly yeah. so you know he'd have that one yeah and then so now we're introduced the hobo has a connection to the a sex worker with a heart of gold. Yes. And he brings Slick to the police. And at this point, we realize just how deep the corruption runs. Yes. It's not like um, what we think of in our current conspiracy theory about politicians is like, oh, they're controlled by X, Y, and Z. Yes. We know for a fact that the There's police are- a bunch are, of dirty cops. Yeah. Yeah, just all dirty cops. In fact, I think one of the characters' name in the credits is Dirty Cop. Yeah, uh, if I remember right, that's actually the guy who played the hobo originally. Yeah, he does make a cameo. Yeah. They're, yeah, good for him. Yeah, they're like, uh, what was it? One of the characters says, like, what about the dirty cops? We're all dirty, dirty cops. cops. Yeah. Well, and it is very funny to see this version of it because a lot of the times in these sort of movies the general theme is either there are no cops i'm the cops kind of uh far far ended there is no no one to save you sort of mindset or you get out um batman world where it's like well we have cops yeah we have a couple dirty cops but man our our chief of police has a heart of gold Mm -hmm. he's trying real hard no this one went straight in and just was like no we have cops. They don't yeah. do anything. Good luck. You're on yeah. your own. And then uh, from here, after uh, he's kicked out of the police station, which, by the way, how did that flip out of the police station? They got everything shot up and they were going to use a stunt double. And he's like, no, I'll do it. And <laughs> no, no, he went, I can do it. <laughs> I've always <laughs> wanted to jump off a building, probably. <laughs> and then... Uh, the director heard, uh, her, like, I don't think the director even knew he was going to do it. And then he just heard, <laughs> Howard's doing the jump. And they're like, what? <laughs> that he just went and did it. You know what? You gotta live out your dreams. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so from there, he reconnects with a uh, sex worker and she takes him back to his place, patches him up. Yep. Yep. And then he has this rant about bears. He does have a very interesting rant about bears, which, I didn't hate the rant about bears. There was a lot of, you know, just general uh, bear knowledge that seemed to be lacking in this town. 
Which does concern me a lot. <laughs> uh, so David Brunt, the original hobo, he apparently is a bear and shark enthusiast. Bear and sharks. And Both the- of those things at the same time, huh? Yes. You know what? Why not? Uh, I think the director mentioned that uh, he, you could go up to his house and or go to his house and there'd be a pile of bear and shark books. Good. Good. And so that's where that idea came from was... He specifically pulled it from a conversation he had with him. With him? him. And See, well, and, like, yeah, it's a weird, like, little scene, but it does kind of help make both the main female and the hobo more of a normal person. Because mm-hmm. you kind of do expect this guy who's kind of wandered around his whole life, he's probably seen a real bear, uh, at least somewhere, <laughs> maybe, He's seen more of a real bear than she's ever seen. She likes bears because they're aesthetically pleasing. Mm -hmm. And he likes bears because he relates to the bear. And that was one of the things the director kept mentioning, that the idea for the hobo was he was a bear in a zoo. Which I can see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. And then on top of that, uh, he pulled a lot from uh, the original hobo. Uh, His big speech about pain and how he shuts it out yeah yeah that was directly from the man yeah and it it was an interesting speech because it was delivered in such a way that depending on what emphasis you took out of certain parts kind of changed who was who in his speech which i kind of like i like that the vagueness of it that it makes sense in his head it doesn't necessarily make sense in her mind she doesn't really get it a lot of people around him when he explains it also don't seem to get it. Her character... She's not crazy bright. But... She's not crazy bright, but... She's not stupid either. Oh, hi, Charlie. Oh, yeah. You tell him. Shoo. No, Charlie would come closer. <laughs> so, after this uh, scene, we're introduced to... The everyone sitting together at a dinner, which the director referred to as the Last Supper. Yes, which saw, with some uh, very scantily clad women. Yeah, there's, beating a there's hobo. A few. Yeah, it was a very abrupt change as well because mm-hmm. we knew that the town had a problem with homeless people, not in just like the sense of there's a lot of them because there was an uncomfortable amount in, but also just street crime in general. Mm-hmm. But also apparently just a ongoing building hatred for homeless people in this town and not just with like slick and his gang but with the general populace seem to have an issue Mm -hmm. with it despite the fact that the only like apartment home we saw was absolutely disgusting like girl get the mold checked out ew (laughs) yeah um so fun fact about that scene one girlfriend in it one single girlfriend. I think it was the producer's girlfriend. <laughs> and they were asking uh, in an interview, was it hard to get her to do that? And he's like, no, not at all. She offered to do it. <laughs> she brought her friends with her. Um, this was a girl's night for them. Yes. Uh, but there's a little interesting bit of trivia about this scene. So it was a closed set because, of course, topless women. Yep, yep. You don't have as many people watching as you normally would. I feel like that's polite. Yeah, and uh, Eisner's parents apparently showed up almost (laughs) every day for shooting at some point. Good, good. And they showed up for this part. Well, surprise. the producer explained in great detail exactly what they were shooting, (laughs) and she gave him this disappointing look. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So uh, he made a comment that this may not be a movie for parents. No, no. This isn't a family watch. No. (laughs) But she did point out, uh, in that scene specifically, that the hobo was almost Jesus-like in that. At the table, Jesus seemed to be missing, and the hobo seemed to be Jesus. Okay, I could see the connection. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't say it's a blatant, obvious connection. No, it's not. But I I, I see where she's going with it. (laughs) Yeah, but, uh, I mean, this movie was made just... Honestly, regardless of whether it made fame or not, everyone had a blast making it. Rutger Hauer said that the movie was made for fun without an audience. It was just made for them. Like, 
honestly, they were amazed that they even got to make this movie. And I'm not saying that it shows, because they did a better job than a lot of movies that I've watched this year. Mm -hmm. Looking at you, Sharknado 4. But I think we're on eight now or something. I haven't gotten that far. Uh. I'm not sure if I want to. <laughs> but you could definitely tell that, especially with how few big names there were in this film, how much effort and strive people were putting mm -hmm. into it. Even characters who are definitely like a one scene, maybe two scenes and done, like the guy with the film recorder. He's recording, he's paying people to beat up mm -hmm. other people on the streets or get beat up on the streets. You know, either way, um, you could tell that this guy was doing his darndest to mm -hmm. be that asshole on the street. And he did a good job. Like, mm -hmm. you genuinely hated that guy, even from the minute you saw him. Yeah. And after this, we also are introduced to uh, the the hobo runs into conflict. He, yes. go, he goes to the guy shooting camera. He chews glass. He does. He makes money. It's very gross. And... <laughs> I, I looked at you when that scene happened, and you were... I don't... Don't put not food things in your <laughs> mouth, and the only reason I could make it through that scene is because I know deep down in my heart that that's sugar. And mm -hmm. sugar is delicious, and it's okay to put in your mouth. Yes. But still, don't put glass in your <laughs> mouth. Yeah. And so, at this point, the hobo has a chance to live the life he wants, to leave the town, mow lawns. Yep, he's got his money. He's at the pawn shop. He can mow. He and, can uh, buy that mower and skip town, because there's no grass in this town. Mm -hmm. But what does he do? Well, you know, he's got to be a hobo with a shotgun, otherwise we've completely missed the point of this movie. The town gets, or the shop gets uh, stuck up by some criminals, and he blows them away with a shotgun that's conveniently priced as the same as the lawnmower. It is, and the other thing that I found, and not just me, a lot of people in our group kind of took issue with, was he picked the shotgun up off of the wall. It's not behind the counter. It is just on the wall and next to the lawnmower, which is in the front window like a puppy for a small child to look at. He picks it up and immediately starts shooting people with it. Yep. This gun has been loaded on the wall, priced at $50 in a town ridden with crime. For how long? <laughs> it feels a little cheap for a shotgun. Yeah, it did feel a little bit inexpensive. Uh, we also questioned how many shots this guy had before he had to reload. Because did he also buy bullets or ammunition of any kind? Like, is he loading it with rocks and gunpowder? I mean, that's viable. It is viable, but I didn't see him reload it almost <laughs> ever. It's, but at the same time, it works because we've moved from this uh, slasher film at this point to more of a slasher western film. And it's, so the idea, like, that that was a whole joke at one point in Westerns was they were shooting off so many guns. And mm -hmm. so, well, now you got to start counting because people were noticing that they were shooting way too many bullets. And this movie kind of just throws that right out the window and says, ah, now the shotgun can shoot eight times before yep. you need to reload. And then after this, we get that little montage of him cleaning, cleaning the town with uh, one shell at a time. One shell at a time, which honestly was a very satisfying part of the movie because a the gore in it was super duper cheesy like we might as well have had spaghetti for arms in some scenes i loved it but also you did get really frustrated with the townspeople and the criminals by mm -hmm. this point in the movie there's so much bad stuff going on and there's clearly plenty of normal looking people in town so you do get frustrated you are kind of on the hobos or on the hobo side with this as far as like why has no one done anything as the uh pedophile santa says pedophile santa was an interesting character uh i'm coming down your chimney tonight or so <laughs> so something like that stupid. but at the same time it's it's perfect yeah it's so perfect for a cheesy is, gore house grind film i also really liked that they it while he's taking down the scum of the city they are doing their darndest to, at the same time, show what level of scummery the city has mm -hmm. hit. So it's not like he's just shooting whoever he finds in the street. He's waiting for them to either prove that they are scum or commit a crime of some mm -hmm. kind. Which means that we are seeing every type of crime that the director could possibly have thought of for this man to shoot. Which I yep. kind of liked the creativity there. Mm -hmm. I think a pedophile Santa sitting in a car with some binoculars was by far the most creative. But, you know. The glove sticks slightly the to the... The glove is so gross. <laughs> so nasty. 
Uh. So gross. But also, at the same time, it's it's just opposed with the complete and total understanding that there are actual parents with children pretending to be a normal, happy mm-hmm. town playing across the street while a man is shooting a Santa Claus in a car with a shotgun. Yep. And no one seems to stop. You don't hear any kids screaming. You don't cut to anyone running away from him. Life well, continues. Earlier in the movie, we saw the Santa drawing, driving off with a kid in the back yelling, help me, and no one stopped. No one, yeah, no one did a single thing. So it was a really nice way of showing that this town has reached such a level of zero cares. that That's one way to put it. Yeah. That even, they don't even care about a man who's genuinely cleaning up the garbage in their town. Mm-hmm. And so, with that, because he's doing what he feels should be done, they start to come after him. Which I think could have been explained a little bit better in this movie, because unless you watch it twice, I think, or Mm -hmm. watch it with a bunch of the background knowledge pre-watching it, I think you would miss the fact that this town already hated homeless people. Mm -hmm. It very much kind of comes across the first watch as like they just hate this homeless person but in reality they already hated them a lot like they were already killing homeless people way before this guy showed up in town Mm -hmm. and now they've just taken it as a stepping block to say well look now all homeless people are this level of crazy and killing people let's just kill all of them it's like the mass hysteria of like one a shark attacks yeah we go out and we slaughter as many as we can yeah it definitely had the same sort of vibe where they show killing people who are clearly not in dangerous to anyone. And honestly, I'm not sure how you distinguish who's homeless in this town and who's not. Because y'all look exactly mm-hmm. the same. Y'all are the same amount of nasty. <laughs> but they, they've they made their own vigilante mob to come after him. Even though he's the one should be leading this vigilante mm-hmm. squad, to be honest with you. And at this time, we're also introduced to one of the more difficult scenes in the movie. Um, yeah. When Slick and Ivan torch a school bus full of children. Yeah, it's not it's not a good time, but I appreciate the style that they went with mm-hmm. because it definitely felt like it what a high school brain would have thought up. Because before this scene, their dad is telling Slick, while Ivan is sitting right there being told that he doesn't exist, He's being told, well, you're not creative enough. That's why people Mm -hmm. aren't afraid of you. See, I'm so creative. I put people and decapitate them with my car and some barbed wire. Mm -hmm. You need to be creative like me. And so a high school kid who's already frustrated, he's already mad, he's already wound up, and was already thinking of really violent things to do, leapt to the thing that he thought was the most devastating thing he could possibly think of, Mm -hmm. which was torch an entire school bus full of children. While his brother sits with boom twin boom boxes. Twin boom boxes. Burn baby burn playing in the background. Which it just kind of goes to show the absolute childness of these two characters, mm-hmm. which you kind of feel bad for both of them because they're just they don't really comprehend what they're doing. And honestly, that movie with today's political and social climate, you could not do that scene i feel no i think especially especially with how recent history with schools have been it it definitely was a heavy scene to watch but Mm -hmm. it also was done in such a logical way that it didn't feel out of place in the movie unfortunately no and on top of that event because of that everyone's out crying we see the massacre of the hobos and eventually they do catch up to him Yes. They catch up to him in the hooker. Well, sex worker's a better term. Yeah, I know that there is preferred terms. I do not know them. I'm sorry. It is sex worker. Okay, I will attempt to use that as best I can. I learned uh, another term that's a bit derogatory. It's called smoky bacon. How fun. Uh, because, and it's specifically uh, sex workers outside of a grocery store. Oh, I have not heard that term before in my entire life. I think it was one of the. I think it was the producer who was mentioning that uh, he worked at a grocery store, and they referred to the women who would hang out in front of it, smoky bacon. I see. I do like though that at some point she lies to the hobo, telling mm-hmm. him that she's a teacher, or at least he gets it in his head that she's a teacher, 
And I kind of like it because you do kind of get this sense from her that if she had had the chance to grow up in a normal town, gone to school, finish her education, she probably would have been a teacher. Mm-hmm. She probably would have been a very good elementary school teacher. Yeah, and it's kind of this idea of sugarcoating. Yeah. Like, hiding the fact that he knows that she's not a teacher. Yeah. But he idolizes her that she could be because she has, again, the heart of gold. Yeah. And I also like that he insists on referring to her as the teacher. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Even after she's blatantly told him, you know, I'm not a teacher, right? And He, He continues anyway because I think the thing that's different about this the hobo as compared to the rest of the town is he sees that there's potential for change in the future and where the rest of the town has just accepted that this is where they are and that's one of the things about it is that one he is arguably the lowest rung of society yeah she's not much higher up than him socially no but he humanizes her yes he sees her as a person not as the uh one of the bad cops calls her a fuck to. You're so rude. Very so rude. So rude, mister. That comes from one of the producer's friends who uh, accidentally referred to his girlfriend at the time of Whoops. that. Yeah. Yeah, maybe don't do that. That sounds yeah. like a bad life choice. Very bad. I think uh, he was kind of ostracized by the whole town because <laughs> it was a town where everyone knew everyone. Uh, yeah, that's a good way to not get to talk to anybody at the grocery store. So, But I also think that this characteristic you can see kind of grow throughout the entirety of the movie with this mm-hmm. character. I guess if you want to say that a character arc, this would have been his crescendo. Because towards the end, when he knows he's not going to get his lawnmower anymore, he knows that this is going to be it for him. He's giving a speech to infants, who definitely cannot hear him. Oh, yeah. Uh, telling them that they they have a better future as long as they choose to change what yeah. they currently have. And so this that happens shortly after because uh, Ivan and Slick show up and almost kill the teacher. Yeah, they, they're they very creative for high school kids. I'll give them that. They're wearing high school, or not high school. <laughs> they're wearing uh, hockey skates. Yeah, one of them is wearing hockey skates. <laughs> like an idiot. Yeah. It's Ivan. Because <laughs> the running joke is that Ivan's the dumb one, but to be honest with you, I think Ivan's probably actually the more creative of the two. Mm-hmm. Because it seems to me like all of the over the topness comes from him and his character. Example: the boomboxes. The boomboxes, I can guarantee, were Ivan's idea. Yeah. But the boomboxes were what made it so much worse of a scene for the school kids. Mm-hmm. Same thing with the hospital killing. Yeah, Slick's method of killing people was creative but wearing your skates all the way there strikes that chord of like he's excited he wanted to wear his skates the whole way to the murder Mm kind of like kids who wear their disney ears the whole way to disney world only in a much darker horrible sense yes and uh at, at this point we really have the peak of drake's anger because yes after they assault them the hobo kills uh slick which, let's not lie, we were not sad about. He got shot in the dick, and I'm okay with it. Yeah, we were all okay with that scene. And I really like the poetic of the children, the, the school bus showing up, and just black smoke billing out. Because originally they had planned for two children to walk out of it, but they removed that from their final cut because they felt it was a bit too much. I can agree with that. I think that the black smoke from the school bus definitely did a better job of symbolically representing Mm -hmm. what they wanted to as opposed to what the kids would have shown. Yeah. That, and it would have added another layer of questions that would have needed to be answered as opposed to closing any. Yeah. And then, so, at this point, now we're at the hospital, which we questioned so much their emergency aid. There's a lot of questions about this hospital. My first question is, what is this building made of? Because there's a scene which I like because I like creative, uh, like, over-the-top fake killing. That's why I like kung fu movies. Mm -hmm. Is, so he's got a gun that he's rigged to launch harpoons, short harpoons, and tied a rope to them and is hanging people with the typhoon launching gun but <laughs> so in a room full of architects this is how the conversation went what is he doing with that 
shoots it into the ceiling, which is an ACT drop ceiling, which is kind of your standard uh, industrial ceiling for those who are not in our field. It's, it's not very strong. If you see people walking over it in movies, it's, it's complete bullshit. lie. Complete lie. The stuff is held up literally by wires that are thinner than a coat hanger. Mm -hmm. Like, and it's usually hung fairly far down from the structure because you've got other stuff up there. There's other things that our MEP friends have to worry about that they all want room for and I make room for them. <laughs> and normally above all of that is your structure for the building. And what our question was is what is the harpoon launching into because it's not the ceiling tiles nope. and it's not the metal structure above and it's not the concrete above mm -hmm. that. So what is it going to? It's like Batman's like launching thing where he would just shoot it off in the distance and then zip away. Or Spider-Man launching spider webs, and you're like, what are you aiming at? Exactly. Yeah. It, and that, that's the thing where, like, with these kind of movies, you just kind of have to shut off a little bit and the, enjoy yes. them for what they are. And I and, think normally we can do that, except we were literally sitting with five architects in a room who all went, no. <laughs> and to explain what's happening is they're being hunted by these pair of mercenaries called the Plague. Yeah, which and I have more questions about the Plague, but more so on just, like, I feel like I missed stuff. Ivan is one of the plague members, by the way. Is he? Mm-hmm. Okay. Or he's one of the actors under the suit. Okay, that makes more sense, because yeah. I looked up the names of the plague, and they do have names. Yes. And I also found a whole bunch of information about, like, them in general, and I feel like I missed something. So, from my understanding, they're just a pair of mercenaries who have... They're kind of like um, the Dread Pirate Roberts. There's always two of them, and when one dies, someone else has to take their place. Are they always named Rip and Grinder? I would assume so, because he's like, she killed Grinder. She must take his place in the plague. Okay, next question I have is, according to Wikipedia, they are famous for killing people such as Abraham Lincoln and Jesus. Joan of Arc, too. How? What? Because they just keep a record of what they've been doing for decades. They, okay, to give more clarification to why I'm confused, both of the Plague members do not look like any, like, old-time world sort of characters. They look like two trash cans that got into a Nazi camp and have made it out, and they look like robots, but bad robots. Adaptation is how you survive. Well... They just, they look so absolutely, like, they look like a child's welding project. Mm -hmm. And that's mostly why I'm confused. Because one of them, I can see maybe how you can get some historicalness from it. Because he does kind of look like a knight with his shoulder pads and his weird World War II helmet thing. The other one just looks like early adaptations of Iron Man. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, but... Regardless, I still like them as characters. Oh, I do too. They're... I think they're creative. I I don't know if necessarily they add a ton to this world. They bring what what they do. I feel they're a point where they are the last line of defense, kind of, and they're sent to tackle. They're sent to do the dirtiest of dirty work. They go. They capture the hobo after shooting up. <laughs> what was Your that? Cat sneezed. <laughs> uh. They uh they go after shooting up the hospital and bring him back to the Drake, yes. where the Drake is now holding him hostage mm -hmm. and is going to have his big the Drake show. Yeah, the Drake show reminded me a lot of one of the Mad Max movies with Thunderdome. I still have not gotten into that. Oh, I've, you would like Thunderdome. I've seen the first and the very last Mad Max movie. <sighs> Thunderdome's my favorite Mad Max. I understand it's not a good Mad Max, but that is why I like it. That one lady's hair, living for it. <laughs> But in this time frame, also, uh, we have, because uh, we're, we're building up to the end of the movie. Yes. So the sex worker gets out of the hospital. and I don't understand how, but she's free to go. Yes. During the assault, she almost has her neck cut off. And they just kind of patch her up. He pours vodka onto her <laughs> neck that he, pr uh. before he chugs it and then pours it onto her neck. So his nasty backwash vodka is now on her neck. But the vodka purifies it. I have questions about that vodka <laughs> and his ability to drink it. So uh, at this point, we have her uh, gear up. Yes. She takes, th this is. I, I, I did like this scene a lot. I really like the gearing up scene in this because yes. she takes the lawnmower. Mm -hmm. The thing the hobo is striving for. Yep. 
and turns it into a shield. Not just any shield, a attack shield. So it still has the blades on the outside, mm-hmm. so she can just kind of... Have you ever seen... Okay, so there's this machine. It's a big piece of equipment, and they use it to chop down trees. And it is up on a, like, a crane arm, oh, and it just kind of yeah. eats trees alive. Yes. It kind of reminds me of that, but on a people scale. Mm-hmm. And then she gives her whole inspirational speech. Yeah, I don't remember any of it. Well, I remember <laughs> part of it where she's like, uh, we all have homes to go to. The streets are their homes. Oh, I remember that now. Yeah, it wasn't a very good And speech. we should show them some goddamn respect or something like that. I, I understand her point, but it's just not a very good speech. Mm-hmm. But that's okay. She's not a speech person. She's a, clearly a welder in disguise because she makes an entire, like, battle suit in a couple of minutes. Yep. It's very impressive. And honestly, as much as I love the rest of this movie, the big showdown is kind of... It's all right. I mean, it's fun to watch, but I wouldn't say it's, like, progressing the story in any way. No. You know what's coming. You kind of already know, like, if you follow these sort of movies... It definitely sticks to that theme of the final final fight where we've we've powered ourselves up as much as we can. We're going to go against the bad guy. We got to have some stake here. Someone's going to lose at mm-hmm. least one limb and yep. then someone will eventually walk away fine. Yep. Yeah, but I didn't hate it. No, I didn't either cuz at this point uh the sex worker kills one of the plague members. Yes. She almost dies in the process, which Shows how almost unkillable these guys are. Yes. And the Drake almost kills the hobo. And I do like him because he doesn't have necessarily a hatred for the hobo. No. Because he mentions that if he had stuck around, he was the one of the best things that ever happened to the town. Yeah, he was entertainment for mm-hmm. the Drake, if nothing else. And then... We have uh, the big standoff. We have the Mexican standoff at the end where he'll shoot the Drake, but all the Drake's henchmen are going to kill him if he does. You know, it it once again felt like a Western. Mm -hmm. And after after listening to the director mention it as that, it's, I can't not unsee it anymore. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. But I don't know, I think it works. Yeah. No, overall, I I thought it... They got their point across. They did a very good job with yes. what they were going for. It wasn't a movie for everyone. It was a movie for them. It was a movie for them, and it's a movie for people who like the gore genre. Mm-hmm. If you like that sort of Halloween movie where it's over the top, someone's foot gets turned into spaghetti noodles, it's mm-hmm. unnecessarily, like, people are filled to the brim with blood, like, squirting little ticks. <laughs> everyone doesn't just bleed, they pop. Or human ketchup packets. Human ketchup packets in this movie. And if you like that sort of movie, you're going to love this mm-hmm. movie. It's right in that genre. It's definitely a good staple even for the genre, just because of how over the top of it is. And for me, especially with how things have evolved in recent years, I feel this movie has some part, some kind of feel to it, where we're starting to see how cities and designers are creating... Yes. Uh, uninhabitable and hostile environments to the homeless. Yeah. And this movie takes it to the extreme. And we're and we're starting to see kind of this reversal of treating homeless and sex workers as lower or subhuman. Yeah. And now we're starting to like, you know, these are people who are down on their luck. Maybe we should do something to help them in little ways as we can. Or at the very minimal, treat them like the humans that they are. Exactly. Yeah, which I think I think this movie definitely has held up through its relatively short by film lifespan. But it's, it's definitely held up because it's touched on enough topics. Mm-hmm. And unfortunately, the other thing that kind of rang in my mind with this one is at no point do they tell us what the city is actually supposed to be. It's not based on... It's not directly mm-hmm. like a ripoff of any direct city that you could pinpoint while watching the movie and say oh that's supposed to be this or this or this but at the same time everyone has a city in the back of their head that they're like is this supposed to be fill in blank here detroit yeah (laughs) but at the same time because it has that background ringing to it 
it makes this movie all the more fun and satisfying to watch. Mm -hmm. Getting to watch someone take this into their own hands. Well, I'm not saying that killing is a good thing, but in, you know, gore house movie scenario, this is a very satisfying movie to watch. You could say killing is a dog. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. Yeah. Um, And for me, that's, that's really the thing why I'm in awe and fascinated with the exploitation genre as a whole fair is because they can touch on these touchy subjects and do it in a fun entertaining way while still hitting real matters and issues yes and i think i like this genre solely for the fact that because they don't expect the audience to be gigantic they're free to take risks Mm mm-hmm More so in the creative sense, so example being the outlandish ways that they are trying to comically kill people, the -the over-the-top character designs, the -the over-the-top costume designs, that sort of stuff I really like, and when it's put in mainstream movies, a lot of the times it either is too much, people don't like it, so the movie doesn't do well, Mm -hmm. or people don't really understand what it's doing there. Nobody cares that these guys look like trash cans that have supposedly killed Jesus. It's fine. Like, it bothers me, but that's because I'm interested and fascinated by them. And less so, like, that it's out of place and shouldn't be here anymore. It's like this scene in a Korean film I watched, I think, maybe this year or last year. Uh, It's called Red Carpet, and it's about an adult film director. Mm-hmm. who is explaining this scene to the actor and actress, and he's saying, you don't understand, this scene is an homage to uh, Chan Wook Park's old boy. <laughs> and the moment he said that, there's a, there's a character, and I'm like, oh, god damn it. I, I know exactly what he's doing here. <laughs> and then one of the other, uh, I think it's the sound or camera guy, he's like, no one gives a shit. No one's going to understand <laughs> that this is what you're referencing. <laughs> and that's kind of why I like this genre, is because... There are those sort of pulls. There are, like, people are freer to bring their friends to be the side actresses and actors. No one, not everybody needs to be a big name. Mm -hmm. It's okay to experiment and play around with it as far as that sort of stuff goes. And I like that. And the director said something that I really admire. And I think this still stems from George Romero's indie, just go out and do it. It's a quote from Ridley Scott. Mm Mm-hmm. Everybody can make a film now. Just fucking do it. This is true. Yeah. This is true. And I have seen a lot of really good ones recently. Mm-hmm. We, I mean, we that... have we have fan-made trailers for Star Wars movies. We have mm-hmm. arguably one of my favorite ones, Hood Cowboy Bebop. Yes. Oh, that sounds amazing. And on top of that, there's just an overwhelming amount of people nowadays who have the ability and time to make this sort of entertainment Mm -hmm. and i think that's super cool and i'm very excited to see where it goes because i i do see the cycle starting to pick back up with people getting paid to do this as opposed to just doing it for free in their free time but i'm excited to see that golden cusp of like a people doing what they love and getting paid to do it rodriguez and tarantino we have grindhouse i mean we we do have movies like that it's just they're not as common as we would like them to be but i think they're getting there yes so I think that that's probably what I'm most excited to see. I think Hobo with a Shotgun will be a good homage. I know there's a ton of people who follow this movie and absolutely love it. I've been sitting here scrolling through the amount of fan-made posters online and cosplay for this, which I didn't think was possible, but it is. (laughs) And it's clear that people absolutely love this sort of movies, and when people love this sort of stuff, more of it gets made, Mm -hmm. and that's what I'm excited for. Exactly. So, Chris, in conclusion, what would you rate this movie? Um, that's a good question. This is definitely not a family movie. But, in the spirit of Halloween, and for those of us, like myself, who love the -the over-the-top, gory movies, this movie is spectacular. It's so much fun to watch. It's absolutely ridiculous. You don't have to watch it with a group to get through it. I would say, for me, this is easily a 9 out of 10. If you are not a Halloween gore person, I would skip this movie. Yes, I I do feel that sentiment after uh, showing it to family and some friends. <laughs> I I still think what uh, director Jason Eisner said 
holds true. Yeah. May not be a movie for parents. It, yeah. I would be a parent yeah. who would love this movie. Or it's I'll be the uncle who loves this movie. There you go. Yeah, this movie is fantastic. It's a lot of fun. You'll get a lot of good laughs out of it while also getting that fun spook factor. It's not a scary movie. It's a gore movie. But it's a fun Halloween movie. Especially if you have a group of friends who all like this sort of stuff. It's a good thing to watch together. It's fine to watch by yourself. And maybe not with your parents. No, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> Anywho, this has been The Good, The Bad, and The Weird. Thanks for listening. Peace. Sorry, Mom and Dad. <laughs> <laughs>